So on this channel, I certainly do a fair amount of making fun of general managers and people who are in power positions and the decisions they make. I give people credit as well, but you know, part of my job is to at times be critical and I certainly maybe uh, have some fun with it as well. And so I figured, hey, you know what? It's only fair to see what I could do, to put my general manager hat on and see if I could actually build a team from nothing. So that's what we're going to be doing in today's video. I've created a whole game uh, and I've created rules and everything just to see how, honestly, just for myself to see how good of a job I would actually do if I was in a GM spot. So here are the rules. First, I'm going to sign free agents. Then I'm going to do a draft. And finally, I will then add more free agents after the draft if I feel as though uh, I need to. So very similar to how an actual NFL team would uh, play out. Now, the issue is I need a team, right? There's already 32 teams. Am I going to be stealing a team or being the new general manager of a different team? No, we're starting from scratch. So I had made my own team. We are called the Orlando Ostriches. So uh, hail to the Ostriches. Uh, this should be a great team. I decided to hire Brian Flores as my head coach. None of this stuff actually matters in terms of the game I've set place. It's just kind of more fun. The game itself so first, what I had to do is I had to sign free agents. And the way I'm going to sign free agents, the math that you have here is there's two things you can do. A, you can make trades. Uh, so if someone gets traded, you can offer more compensation than what got offered there. So for example, if someone goes for a third round pick, I have to either offer a second or a third and another pick to make the trade work for myself. For the actual free agents, I could just sign them to whatever deal they got, but that's not really fair, right? They chose that spot for a reason, and if I match that offer, they probably, or at least there's a good chance they would have chosen that same spot. So what I have to do is spend 10% more than whatever the actual contract was if I want any free agents. So 10% more on each contract, and if it's someone who returned to their former team, I then have to spend 20% more if I want to get them on my team. So that's the math behind it. Let's get into who I decided to sign. So we're starting off with the offense. The offensive players I decided to sign before the draft. So Amari Cooper at the top, obviously he was a trade. What I did was, because he originally went for a fifth and a sixth round swap, I gave up a fifth and a seventh straight up. So I gave up two picks instead of one. Gave up the more compensation, but I get Amari Cooper. I also signed DJ Chark, Allen Robinson, uh, Jamison Crowder, and kind of Odell Beckham Jr. So this is the projected contract PFF has him getting. He is not under contract, but he's someone who I would have certainly signed at that price value. And even if it was more expensive, I probably would pay for pay him. So again, he hasn't actually gotten a contract yet. He's the one guy, though, I decided to just go up and say, okay, I'll give him a $5 million deal. But if it comes out that he gets way more than that after recording this video, then I'll make some adjustments, maybe tweet out my adjustments. For the offensive line, you certainly see a trend here. I added five starters with the offensive line and didn't spend a ton of money on any of these guys. Now, a couple I spent decent money on, Ben Jones, Mark Glenowski, uh, even Ted Carreras. Uh, those guys aren't getting nothing. Morgan Moses is getting a little bit as well. Billy Turner is certainly a value free agent in my opinion, but that's kind of my logic. I'm, I'm a big believer in you just want five guys who can play. That's how you get a solid offensive line. So that's what I'm doing here. Finally, for halfbacks, I added Raheem Mostert here, or is it Mostert? Still don't know. Uh, hopefully when he's in the building with me in the Orlando Ostriches facility, he will help me uh, pronounce his name correctly. But I think he's a solid back. And again, running backs do matter. They don't matter as much as some people believe they do, but there's still value in a quality halfback. So for only 2.3 million, getting a solid halfback, I like this move. For defense, you notice I didn't add as much. This is defense and special teams. Uh, JC Jackson, though, the big one at 18.2 million for five years. I think getting a true number one corner has some real value. And then the other two options here, Levi Wallace and Casey Hayward. I think Hayward was good last year. I think he could certainly play. And even Levi Wallace, again, a good value signing. And I think you notice I like those guys, the guys who I don't have to spend a ton of money on, but were good last year because you'll probably be good next year. Guys like Deron Harmon and Maurice 
Hurst were real value signings, in my opinion, really underrated guys who I don't have to spend you know, much of anything on, and they should be effective players for me and could even be starters. So love those two signings as well. And then Youngway Koo here. Uh, he's I'm paying him some money, but listen, I think kickers matter. I think that there's data to back up the fact that having a good you know, high quality kicker has a lot of value in the NFL and is totally worth more money than people are giving them. So getting us, I had to pay the 120% of what the Falcons had, you know, actually paid him, but I think it's worth it because I think he's really valuable. So that was step one. Now on to step two. So I got the base of my team, but I still have to do a draft now. And here's the issue. I didn't have a team last year. The Orlando Ostriches are in their inaugural season. So with this being said, with it being our first year, where do we decide where we pick? Well, last time the NFL did this, they just gave them the first overall pick. I didn't think that was totally fair. I didn't think I deserved the first overall pick just from coming in here. I could have done that, but I decided not to. So I'm doing something a little bit different. What I decided to do was I used a random number generator, one through 32. But it's not like I had an even odd to get each one of them. What I did was, it's kind of a, a it's two choices and then a suicide, I think is the, the way you pronounce this game, where basically the way it works is, I use the random number generator, let's say I got 15 out of 32. Then I have the choice to stay with 15 and pick 15 throughout the whole draft, or go again. If I go again, then it might be a different number. Let's say it's 20. I can choose to stick at 20, or I can choose to go again, and if I go again, I have to take whatever it ends up on. So you only get three total options uh, if you do that. Uh, so And, you know, there's a risk every time you say no because you could end up with a really bad pick. So I had this whole fun game set out for me to do. Uh, if it's a little bit complicated, don't worry too much because I just, the first time I did it, I landed on number three. So I said, okay, I'll stick with number three. So long story short, I will be picking third overall. But again, if you're playing along at home, if you want to do this game as well, that's the rules that I uh, set out this time. Or you could just do what I did and, you know, I ended up on three. You could get number three overall as well. So third overall pick. With that number three overall pick, the first thing I wanted to do in a draft like this that I think has a, a really good top 100 and a really good like top 75, I think in particular, I wanted to get more top 75 picks than just the three I would have gotten. So I decided I was going to trade down with number three. That was a decision I made. Also, uh, I guess I got to explain, how do I do the draft? Well, I would have loved to just, you know, draft along at home, but there was one slight issue with doing that in the issue of just, you know, looking at the actual results of the draft and I'm picking the spots then is I felt like that would have given me too much of an unfair advantage because I would know where everyone's going to fall. And for example, if there's a player I like who fell to like the fourth round and maybe I would have drafted them in the second uh, because I like them, uh, that would have been an unfair advantage for me. So uh, because of that, what I instead, and also, you know, I could have like traded up uh, one spot prior to every player I liked and drafted them then. So that would have felt like, like cheating to me. So I decided to do a mock draft instead. I used the PFF mock draft simulator, which has trades. And the first thing I did was trade it down with the Seattle Seahawks, the Seahawks who had the ninth overall pick. And then I was able to get a couple, uh, I got the 40th, 41st and 109th pick to do that trade down, which to me is absolutely worth it. So these are the first half of my results. I had to split it in two halves just for formatting. Uh, but so you see at the top, my trade down, I think it was a good move. And then what I was able to get with number nine is still Derek Stingley, who I had a real dilemma on my hands when I pick Stingley. There was a couple other guys I really liked. George Karloftis and Devin Lloyd, I both think are good players as well. I just kind of felt like, you know what, Stingley's in the most important position, even though I could definitely use an edge rusher or a linebacker. I don't have any. I wanted a more valuable player, and I, I feel like you can get other edge rushers later on in the draft, which you see I did. So round two, I ended up going with Matt Corral with the 37th overall pick. I think getting any of these qu quarterbacks in the second round is a smart move. I think that the potential value there is good. I like all these guys as second round talents for sure. In fact, I even tried to trade up to number 32 with Matt Corral to get a potential fifth year option if he did end up working out. Uh, but unfortunately, Pittsburgh did not agree to make a trade with me. So I ended up 
uh, sticking at 37. Still got my guy, though. Just would have liked to have the fifth-year option. So at 41, I drafted Drake Jackson. Good edge rusher out of USC. I think has a lot of potential. But I also traded away the 40th pick for a 52 and 84. Again, like I said, I'm trying to get more of these top 100 picks. So getting 84, I can probably get someone who I believe is a top 75 player who I like. So this is this was my strategy going into this draft. If I had opportunities to trade down, I was going to take them. That's what I did here, getting an extra pick here. And I still got Cameron Thomas, who was the guy I kind of wanted at that spot anyways. So I still got my guy and got an extra draft pick. Then Alec Pierce here. Uh, I'm basically just always a fan of drafting wide receivers in the third round. It seems like you can still get pretty solid players, and I think Pierce is an underrated player. I really liked his tape. So getting Alec Pierce here, getting a couple edge rushers, a potential starting quarterback in Matt Corral, and a guy, a cornerback who has elite traits, I think this top half I feel very strong about. The bottom half it started with yet another trade here, trade it down. Like I said, hey, if I get these opportunities to trade down, I'm going to do it. Although it's kind of a trade down and trade up. So I traded back 10 spots in the third round and received an 100th overall pick, but I also had to give up a sixth rounder to do it. So I lost 10 spots and a sixth rounder, but I gained the 103rd overall pick. So again, if I think it's a top, good top 100, that's my strategy going in. Well, getting someone like that, I think has value. So got Brian Cook, Again, always a fan of getting uh, safeties in the third round as well. I think that that typically is a smart idea. And then uh, with that 103rd pick that I gained, I drafted Bailey Zappi. Again, I need quarterbacks, right? Uh, all I have right now is Matt Corral, who I like. I think he has a lot of potentials. Obviously, I drafted him in this early in the second round. So I, I do see some value with someone like him. But Hey, you never know. It's always a good idea to kind of double down, I think, on quarterbacks because you don't want to just go into the year with one option. Having a plan B is smart. It, going back to when the uh, Washington football team, formerly known as a different name, when they traded up to get RG3 and spent a lot of picks on him, they still drafted Kirk Cousins later on. That's kind of what I'm doing with Zappy here. Um, Neil Farrell Jr. I think could be a good interior defensive lineman at pick 108. He's someone who I'm very fascinated by and at the very least could just be like a solid contributor because again, we need defensive linemen. Uh, Jeremy Ruckert, uh, he's someone who right now I have no tight ends. So getting a tight end in the room helps, but I wanted to go tight end anyways. I, that was kind of part of my strategy of not signing a tight end early was because I felt like you can get quality tight ends on day two or even early day three like we see here so that was a logic there then uh with halfbacks Kyron Williams uh who again uh I think it's just a good idea to get running backs kind of late day three they tend to be guys who can contribute and finally CJ Wright who he's someone who I mean he's had decent production so that's kind of why I decided to go out and get him kind of banking on hey maybe that can translate to the NFL level and you can at least be a contributor it's the seventh round I'm not expecting too much from you again part of my strategy was not picking too much in the 150 plus categories he was the only guy I picked over you know after 148 and only one of two guys I picked after 110 but you know there was there was some logic here also at the bottom what you're going to see is a, a seemingly a weird trade of a seventh round swaps uh ignore that the reason why that is there and i uh i could have edited this one out i edited some others out basically you know the reason why i'm the texans in this scenario is simply because uh you know they picked third overall but i had to make some trades to make sure that i was only getting their third overall draft selections so i had to trade away all the extra picks they had acquired and i also had to trade for some of the picks that they had gotten rid of so uh that's all that that's just again a logistics thing for the game that we have so okay good draft but there's still a couple of positions that i still need especially linebacker i have no linebackers currently so uh now i can sign players after the draft so going over here these are the players i have signed post draft and my rule for this is since it's been long enough I think that I can get whatever your PFF projected value is. I can just sign it at that. I don't have to overpay now at this point. The guy's pre-draft, I had to overpay. I had to outbid someone. But now I think I can just sign whoever I want at their projected value. That's that's the way this rule works from here. So 
The players I have signed post-draft first, as I said, needed some linebackers. So Alexander Johnson, KJ Wright, and Josh Bynes. Those three guys should be able to help me out a lot. I also added Jordan Atkins on a two-year, $3.8 million a year deal. Someone like Jordan Atkins, he's just someone who uh, I think has potential, and it's kind of like taking a flyer on a little bit. But also, again, I needed a second tight end. I, I can't just go into the season with one tight end. So I'm getting someone who has potential, a little bit higher of a cap hit than some of these other guys, but someone who I think I like. Uh, I also added Jerry Hughes. This is kind of like a, hey, I have some money. Why not uh, help out that defensive line that could use some help? I also added some uh, offensive line depth. So three guys, Bobby Massey, Matt Paradis, and Michael Schofield. But you notice I skipped over someone when talking about them. Jadavian Clowney I added as well. And he wasn't someone who I went into the offseason preparing to sign. But A, it's a one-year deal. So I'm washing my hands clean of it after this year. If it doesn't work out, I don't really care that much. I'm not going to hurt any of my you know, potential moves for next year, right? Which was important to me. I didn't want to, you know, sign someone on a contract deal I didn't love and then hurt myself for the following year. I wanted to still be in, you know, a big part of it was I wanted to be in good position next year to continue to be competitive. Uh, and so that's what Clowney does. And that's also what someone like Kareem Jackson does. Really good safety who, you know, uh, I think I'm getting at a pretty, honestly, a steal here at just 3.5 million. I don't need a safety necessarily, but I could use an extra guy in the room and this should make things, you know, better for me. So here's my final depth chart at the top. Those are how many draft picks I have available. Uh, you see that I don't have the fifth or seventh because I traded away or traded for Amari Cooper, gave up those picks. I meant to do those for the 2022 draft, but I honestly just forgot when I did my draft and just drafted as though I had seven picks anyway. So, okay, I took them out for the following year. That's fine. Uh, but that's, that's just the reason why I did it that way. Uh, but yeah, my quarterbacks, I have Matt Corral and Bailey Zappi, and you see really low cap hits. And that's one of the things I learned from doing this exercise. I mean, I already knew it, but like it really kind of hit home for me how important it is to get guys on rookie deals and why it probably will be hard to be competitive immediately because I need more guys on rookie deals before you really can. Because I mean, look at like, you know, if Matt Corral hits and is at least a decent quarterback, getting decent quarterback play for 2.3 million would be awesome. Again, the wide receivers, a lot of wide receivers, and you certainly can tell that this was a strategy of mine is to get just a lot of players in the room because and just you know see who hits basically because Amari Cooper, DJ Chark, Allen Robinson, uh, Odell Beckham Jr., Jamison Crowder, and Alec Pierce. So six quality guys with solid potential here and can do different things as well. You know, uh, Allen Robinson and Crowder's uh, skill sets are very different, but that's a good thing. It doesn't really matter in the for, you know, in the grand scheme of things for this game, it doesn't matter at all. But I kind of like to pretend like, you know, this is a real thing as well. So this would be, a, I think, a really complete receiving core with, you know, Cooper and Robinson on the outside. And then take your pick with Chark, Odell, Crowder, and Pierce all competing for that stuff. And, you know, uh, these guys can play special teams as well. So I can have them work there if I need to. Again, the offensive line uh, definitely was a position I decided to try to save some money on. But I think I still got a decent amount of talent here, you know. Five solid quality starters, along with a backup tackle, center, and guard, who I think are all also quality. So for any of these guys, uh, you know, if someone does get hurt, which does happen at the offensive line, I'm not screwed at all. I think I should still be okay. And if someone just doesn't play well, you know, falls off a cliff or whatever due to age or whatever, I still have backup plans. For the tight end situation, you know, Jeremy Ruckert, I'm, I'm interested in seeing. I think he's someone who might have some untapped potential. And again, cost basically nothing. If he's just a depth uh, tight end, then we're cool. Jordan Atkins could hopefully be a starter. If not, I still do have to pay him for next year, but then we're good. So it's a lower risk, higher reward type move. And even $3.8 million for a backup tight end, it's a bit much. It's not the end of the world. Going over here now, so for a halfback room, Kyron Williams and Raheem Mostert, honestly, that's a solid halfback room. You don't need the stars. They should be fine. Um, secondary is definitely going to be a strong suit here with J.C. Jackson, Levi Wallace, Casey Hayward, and Derek Stingley, uh, who, you know, you also kind of see with this, okay, a top 10 pick does get a little bit more money than uh, these second rounders and third rounders do, $5.9 million a year, plus there's a fifth-year option. So the fifth-year option, you know, that makes it work a lot better. You like that, uh, that you like to have that for sure. But one of the things I like about having a pretty complete secondary, but also having Derek Stingley is that 
I can put Stingley in whatever role I want for him, right? If he's not ready as a rookie, well, then, okay, we'll just, you know, we'll ease him into this and see how things work. If he is ready as a rookie, well, then, cool, let's just have him be corner two, have Casey Hayward just be sort of a rotational guy, and have Levi Wallace be sort of a rotational guy, and JC Jackson and Derek Stingley are both, you know, going to be our starters, and great, now we have hopefully elite cornerback play uh, on either side of the field for five straight years, that would be awesome. But if that doesn't quite work out because I am relying on a rookie, we still have three good corners and aren't screwed by any means. And then finally, uh, for safeties, you have Deron Harmon. Again, like that value signing, uh, Brian Cook, who also is not going to cost that much. And again, for someone like him, you know, uh, if you're a safety, if you're a wide receiver, if you're some of these positions, maybe even corner, you, I can at least get you to play some special teams. Uh, you know, if you're not starting, Kareem Jackson will probably be the starter. And then I would assume the way we would do this is Harmon and Jackson start off as the starter. But, you know, Harmon and Cook kind of rotate in and out a lot with Jackson spending the majority of the time out there. But even him, if he's not out there, Harmon and Cook can both be out there. Finally, front seven. Again, my Team building philosophy is build from the outside in. That tends to be the smart way to do it. You draft the defensive and offensive linemen. And really, defensive linemen is the kind of the main way I wanted to uh, draft guys because it seems like the decent defensive linemen get like $15 million a year. But like you see, okay, linebackers, Alexander Johnson, who's a good player from, from Denver. I, I think that, you know, $7 million, I like that contract. And then KJ Wright and Josh Bynes are two guys who, again, Quite frankly, uh, there will be a lot of just playing one linebacker out there, right? Because we, we will have uh, a good amount of five defensive back sets. We'll probably have some three safety sets just given the, you know, uh, fact that we have three good safeties. So we, you will see a little bit of that. And then Wright and Bynes can kind of combine for that. those other reps. And Johnson will kind of be the every play linebacker, I would think. Uh, for edge rushers, Clowney, Drake Jackson, and Cameron Thomas. And one thing I like about this Clowney signing too is sort of like I said a little bit with the Stingley signing, right? Is adding Clowney, what it does for my team is Drake Jackson and Cameron Thomas don't have to both be great immediately. If they are, cool. They'll all get reps, right? Because you rotate defensive linemen. So uh, they'll all get 600 plus snaps as long as they're healthy regardless. But this way, if like, say for example, Drake Jackson hits immediately, Cameron Thomas looks like he needs more time well then at least for like the key downs we can still have two good edge rushers as opposed to solely relying on just those two edge rushers also for defensive interior linemen kind of a similar thing with like Jerry Hughes and uh, Maurice Hurst who should be solid contributors uh you know again I don't know how much confidence you can really have in a guy who wasn't even a top 100 pick in Neil Farrell Jr even though I do like him and a guy who was a seventh round pick in KJ Wright maybe not that much maybe they'll just be depth but if that is the case yeah that's still not a horrible interior defensive line I don't think this is still a a defensive line that can help stop the run. This is still a front seven that can stop the run decently well. It might not be elite at it, but I think it would still be pretty good at it. Finally, I have Young Wei Ku, and I have 15 replacement level players. What that is, is listen, I didn't really feel like grinding through special teams tape to figure out which special teamers I wanted and all of that stuff. So the last little wrinkle to this rule that you're allowed to do is get what's called just a replacement level player. What this means is someone who you would sign off the street. They're going to give you replacement level value and they cost $1 million and you're getting them for one year. That's the that's the idea there. So I'm getting 15 of those players to fill up my roster, meaning that I have spent $207.2 million. The salary cap is at 208, so I am under the salary cap and I think got like a pretty decent team. I feel pretty good about this and how everything worked out. So finally, these are my projections as to how the team is going to go, because that's the final aspect of this is how do I like evaluate how good of a team I made, right? So the way I'm going to do it is if you've watched my analytical power rankings video where I kind of what I do is I look at historically how many wins it typically gets you for having, you know, X high position group. So for example, uh, how many wins does a top five quarterback typically get you? It's a little bit over four. How many does the, you know, a six through 11 quarterback typically get you in each of those ranges? I assign a win total to each position group uh, for each team. Well, I'm going to do something similar here. I'm going to look at the PFF grades for these players at the end of the year. I will then, you know, use a, a, an algorithm of, you know, how many snaps the average team gets and all that stuff to figure out uh, how many wins that a team like this would have probably gotten 
and you know given this whole algorithm so that's what i'm doing here so my projections for how my team will perform is i think that quarterback play i don't have too high of hope i'm hopeful that we'll at least avoid bottom five play bottom five play gets you zero uh, zero is obviously the bot the floor for all of this stuff uh so i think we can at least get to tier four which is one win or you know one win just like that and there's even you know the optimistic potential would be if Matt Corral is, becomes a top 10 quarterback in year one which seems highly unlikely but hey Mac Jones did it maybe Corral can do it uh so that would be the you know optimistic view I think for wide receiver core I did tier two to tier one which would be 2.86 to 3.41 I feel pretty good though we'll get tier one I put a lot of resources into that so I would hope so uh, offensive line I think can be mediocre again the way offensive lines tend to suck is by having guys who just aren't good we don't have that issue here in Orlando we don't uh, we might have some guys who uh, aren't superstars but I think that's fine I think we can still get to tier three with that the running game I spent basically no resources into it but I still think there's a chance we can get some value out of this running back room as for run defense coverage and pass rush I do think coverage should be good again spent a lot of resources into that so hopefully that can be a three win unit that would be a, a top five unit uh run defense and pass rush I have as mediocre for both that's how much you get for mediocre at for both but again there's maybe hope that it could be better I suppose there's hope it could be or not hope but I, I suppose there's a chance it could be worse as well we have some young guys who knows exactly how they will perform but I think at least some of them should be solid I'm projecting young way Koo to be a top five kicker I'm paying him like one so hopefully that works out meaning the total in the projections for my team for next year that I'm going pre sneezing would be 5.5 to 12.8 wins I think that again the quarterback play always is going to determine a lot of this and that's why I made sure I added two quarterbacks because you have to get quarterbacks uh the reality is with all of these decisions I made if I don't get a good quarterback like it doesn't matter as much so yeah all right that's my video uh this is really a fun video to make this I'm not sure this is gonna I think definitely gonna be one of those that I had more fun making than maybe everyone else uh, had watching I had a blast making this video uh, I thought it was a really cool exercise and it's something you can do as well if you want to leave a comment in the comment section below of what you would do again remember the rules any free agents you sign that are off the market currently the way you do it is you have to add 10 percent uh to their contract so whatever it is so a 10 million dollar contract is now 11 million uh for you math fans out there unless they go to their former team and they re-sign with their team uh, but again if they re-sign with their team what you have to do is it has to be they re-sign with their team once free agency started so uh then you can add 20 percent to the total uh i also did something where so you can make trades but you can only make trades if it seemed like the team traded the player to wherever the most value went to uh so for example Tyreek Hill I would have loved to make a Tyreek Hill trade but I can't because Tyreek Hill wanted to go to Miami so uh, you know nothing he doesn't want to go to Orlando maybe Orlando is close enough that he would have dealt with it I don't know but uh you know realistically same thing with Devontae Adams he wanted to go to Las Vegas they let him go to Las Vegas because of that uh so I couldn't have made that trade if I wanted to which I certainly would have been interested in at least in doing something like that although I need draft picks so maybe not but again it's uh those are off the table what you have to do is you have you can only make the trades that would make sense uh that's the way that works for mock drafts uh you know use the PFF mock draft simulator if you want to do that make sure you trade beforehand and get the actual picks that you want you can either do you know pick third overall like I did or do the random number generator like I did if if I were you I'd rather do the random number generator I think that's more fun but I'll let you take the pick uh that's how you can do that then post draft when you have to make more signings what you can do is you you know just add more talent so you can sign them just what their projected value is on if you use pffs uh, free agency tracker they have projected contracts for like all the top 200 guys so that'll help you out there uh, and then finally remember replacement level players one million dollars each that fills up the roster so remember you have to do that uh, and that's kind of what makes this fun I think in a lot of ways it just helps you kind of when you construct your own team it helps you realize oh this is why roster construction is so important like this is why you see stuff like this happen and why you know it can be a little bit more tricky um last rule I guess to talk about if you're again if you're someone who's making this stuff uh, I'm not sure if anyone is but I figured yeah, I'll, I'll give all the rules uh, to it as well maybe you were confused when I explained it earlier 
Um, one last thing too is you have to keep it under the salary cap is what I did, but I actually said you can go within 10 million over the salary cap. I think that's a fine rule to make. Uh, so you can go up to 10 million over the salary cap, but then you have to make the actual salary cap work where you have to push money on to next year in which year, uh, you know, once you do that, actually it was, it was 15 million over 15 million over the salary cap. And you can do that, but you have to then push it out to next year. And you have to keep track of, okay, if I spent 15 million more over the salary cap this year, that means next year I had 15 million less. That's that is how uh, it ends up working out. So yeah, uh, I hope that was uh, interesting to you. I had a blast making it. Uh, and who knows, I might make some uh, ostrich uh, adjustments throughout the course of the season, perhaps. And maybe I'll, I'll tweet that out or something if that happens. And then I guess I'll make a video next year and do it all over again and see what, you know, how well my team did and what I do, can do to add to it, how I can try to win a Super Bowl. That's the goal. Uh, and I think I have a chance to at least make the playoffs year one, which is, uh, that's my my realistic goal. But, or, you know, at least be decent. Uh, it, again, it, it's, it's a rebuilding year. First year, we're not going to win the Super Bowl first year probably, but uh, I think I added some talent. So what do you guys think of all this? Let me know in the comments below. Always love hearing from you. And of course, as always, thanks for watching.